interrupted for two hours, one hour, whatever the class time is. No more noise. If they want to play outside, they can go outside and play. This is not the time for playing. Anybody there to take care of them? I can take them up the upstairs if you want. Know, so the then start running and then oh. And we want to listen completely. Even it is 8 30, 9 o'clock, please have a seat. Prashadam is there for everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Prabhu. Koma Gyana Timirandhasya, Yanan Janisha Lakaya, Chakshurun Militam Yena, Asmai Shri Gurave Namaha. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale, Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta, Swami Iti Namine, Namaste Saraswati Deve, Gauravani Pracharine, Nirvishesha Shunyavadi, Pashatya Desha Tarine, Vancha Kalpata Rudhascha, Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha, Patita nam pao nebhyo, Vaishna vebhyo namo namaha, Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadhara, Shri Vasati Gaura Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you today. And I'll speak today and tomorrow on the topic of training ourselves to interrupt the train of our thoughts. <laughs> training ourselves to interrupt the train of our thoughts. Now, what do I mean by this topic? First of all, <coughs> Our thoughts go from one to another, to another, to another. And as they keep going, they also keep growing. So often one incident happens. I remember in my childhood, I was the organizer of one competition in school. And at that time, uh, so we had organized the competition. It was like essay writing competition. And I was known as one of the good writers in our school. So I had organized that. And then this competition went off very successfully and many students participated. And then the prizes were to be distributed. So I was sitting and the students were going and I was also of course a student, but I was one of the organizers. And then this various students were going and winning the prizes and the teachers and the principal was distributing the prizes. And at that time, At that time, suddenly, as I was watching this, this was the whole event was reasonably successful. But suddenly, the thought came in my mind: you know, Oh, nobody appreciates me. I worked so hard to organize this program, but all these students are being appreciated, and they are winning the prizes. Nobody appreciates me. And then I just that thought: Oh, you know, okay, this time nobody appreciated. That time nobody appreciated. That time nobody appreciated. And it was just. Five minutes before, I was very happy, thinking that, oh, they have organized this whole competition and it's been so wonderful. And just the next five minutes later, I was so agitated. And then suddenly, you know, one of the students who had won, he came, he, he came to me, he was very happy, he had won the first prize. And he came to me, he was, I was in the ninth, 10th standard and he was in the 5th, 6th standard. So he just came along. And he was just saying to speak to me, and I was about to snap at him because I was so angry. And it struck me, what am I doing? What, at one moment, I was so happy, I was quite happy, and suddenly, after a few moments, I was just so agitated. One of my hobbies in childhood was that I I like to look at the universe with a through a telescope. So one of my favorite past times at that time, <laughs> there was a time pass in a sense, <laughs> but, but it was that I would go to our terrace and look at the telescope, look through the telescope at the sky. 
and we were waiting for some lunar eclipse to occur and then suddenly i just zoned off i was looking at it looking at it and suddenly i got lost in my thoughts and then it struck me at that time i'm i'm so interested in what happens out there in the skies but what happens in here can sometimes be so you can call it interesting or distracting either way that it can just consume my attention so what actually goes on inside so i was look i had come i had prepared anticipating that night when we would see the eclipse we been looking out for it for a lot many days but when that moment came i suddenly zoned off so what so that was supposed to be very interesting for me but somehow thoughts captivated me so from that time i was thinking actually what exactly happens in our inner world and we all can see that our thoughts just flow from one to second to third and our moods can rapidly change because of this flow of thoughts so krishna talks about this train of thoughts in the bhagavad gita in the second chapter in verses 62 and 63 He talks about ध्यायतो विषयान पुम्सह संगस्ते शुपजायते संगात संजायते कामह कामत क्रोधो विजायते क्रोधात भवति सम्मोह सम्मोहात स्मृति विभ्रम स्मृति भ्रमशाद बुद्धिनाशो बुद्धिनाशात प्रणश्यति तो कृष्णा इज टेलिंग हियर फ्रॉम द जर्नी फ्रॉम कंटेम्पलेशन टू सेल्फ डिस्ट्रक्शन ध्यायतो इज कंटेम्पलेशन प्रणश्यति इज destruction self destruction now this specifically is with respect to sense objects dhayato vishayan pumsaha when we contemplate our sense objects but this can apply to anything it can apply to sen- uh, to the to the temptations for pleasure it can also apply to negative emotions so i may go to office and my and i see a strange look in my boss eyes and immediately my mind starts imagining is my boss going to fire me <laughs> oh if my boss fires me what will happen to me you know i will have no job i have no job how will i earn money if i can't earn money how will i pay the mortgage for my house if i can't pay the mortgage for my house then i'll be evicted from my house if i'm evicted from my house nowadays houses are so difficult to get if i'm on the streets and it will be so cold <laughs> and here right now i'm trembling because of the ac but in my mind i am trembling because of the cold outside <laughs> so the mind's train of thoughts it can start from one stimulus and it can take us to any extreme so now how does uh, so the strain of thoughts uh, can sometimes take us to a good destination also thoughts are not our enemies thoughts are simply we could say pattern of ideas in our head i'll come to a little later when i'll talk elaborately about what exactly thoughts are but thoughts are not the problem it is our readiness to uncritically believe our thoughts that is the problem so when the thought comes in oh what if this happens what if you lose your job then that one thought can just grow 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 and we keep believing it that is where it becomes a problem so how do thoughts overwhelm us like this so sometimes we get lost in thought now this can be bad when we get absent minded but it can also be good if we want to ponder deeply about a subject and understand the issue then thoughts themselves are you could say neutral they can be good they can be bad they 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 whether they will lead to something good or something bad it is for us to evaluate and it is for us to respond properly now the word thought itself can have two different meanings before we move forward to understand what are thoughts the the words themselves have multiple meanings one time i was traveling from one place to another and just before i i got from i went from the house out i picked my suit the devotee picked my suitcase and the handle just came off <laughs> so then the handle came off then at that time when I was checking whether we could fix it. So the devotee told me in America, you know, buying new things is easier than fixing anything. It's very complicated. So they just gave me a new suitcase, and because they were carry, they were just took the suitcase and the wheelchair assistant took the suitcase to the check-in uh, point. 
So then by the time the flight, we re- I landed and I came to the carousel, and I had forgotten what the suitcase looks like. So because it was a brand new suitcase. <laughs> so then, and somehow the luggage tag that was there, that was left with the devotee at the other place. So then as I was, I just remembered that it had a red handle. So then all the suitcases with the red handles were picking up and looking. So we're looking at all the suitcases. <laughs> so now, why am I giving this example? That the, the terms are like the handles and the concepts are like the suitcase. So the term is like a handle. So we all have certain thoughts, certain ideas in our mind, but term, words, words or terms specifically, they're the tools which we use to communicate with the ideas. So the terms themselves, just like the same colored handle can be there are many suitcases. So similarly, the same word can have many different meanings. So the word thought is like one handle, but what suitcase it is attached to, it can vary. So there's two simple meanings which are relevant for our context here. I got a thought and I have given this a lot of thought. You can see the difference over here? <laughs> I got a thought. That means it's just an event which occurred in our inner world. Just, it's been some, some idea just came in. Many times in cartoons or comics you show, somebody's light lights in their yeah. brain, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so that's like you got an idea. So a thought, I got a thought means that uh, some something got stimulated in our inner world. Hmm? And the second is, I have given it a lot of thought. That means, here the so first thought means just an initial triggering event in our world. The second thought means systematic contemplation or analysis. So thought can have both these meanings. And when we, when the thought occurs first, if we identify with it, if we get carried away with it, then it acquires momentum. And the stronger the momentum, the more difficult it is to stop it. It's like say, if somebody is, uh, say a car is moving along the road and the car starts going off track. Then if you press a brake, it will stop gradually. But depending on how fast it is moving, that much time it will require to stop because it has got more and more momentum. Similarly, when Krishna talks about the sequence from Dhyayato Vishayan Pumsa, from contemplation to self-destruction, what he's talking about is that initially Dhyayato, just thought has come in, we are are giving it some attention now. At that time, it's like the car has just started. But by the time it moves forwards more and more, there is contemplation, then there is infatuation, then there is irritation. We'll talk about this later. But as it moves forward, the momentum becomes stronger and stronger. And then to stop it becomes more and more difficult. So thought refers initially to an event that occurs in our inner world. So we could, for simple purposes, we could say thoughts are simply words in our head. It's not exactly true. I analyze the difference. But words inside our head, if we come, come consider that, say there is a screen inside us. So say we decide to do something important. The student appears for exam or we decide to give some competitive exam or we decide to do something challenging and somehow it doesn't work out and then the thought occurs in our mind you are a failure you are a failure you are good for nothing now when this thought has come in it is like there's an inner screen and an inner screen these letters have appeared you are good for nothing now, as we keep looking at it, it's like we keep looking at it, it keeps growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, you, when it starts, you are good for nothing. And as we keep hearing it, our mind starts, our consciousness starts in, getting invested in it. And in other incidents, you know, see that time also didn't work out. That time also you made a foolish mistake. Here also you made a mistake. Here also, you, therefore, you are good for nothing. So the mind, when, when thoughts come in our head, as a train of thought starts moving, basically they give us one perspective and one narrative. Perspective means how we look at things. 
narrative means how things flow so one perspective okay oh, you are good for nothing so why well, that's one perspective but one narrative means this is how things are going to turn out and things for us yes we all are human and the only way that we will never commit any mistakes is if we will never do anything <laughs> <laughs> to err is human so we all commit mistakes but at that time at one person say yes see you committed a mistake and then the narrative goes forward that you always made this mess, mess of things and then as that from that perspective that narrative starts moving forwards we start feeling more and more miserable we start getting distressed we start getting completely agonized so basically a thought initially when it comes it is like a, it is like a word appearing on our inner screen it's not working yeah it's working but not as well as you like it's okay no like when you're not talking into the mic you're like looking from side to side and going with them but isn't it isn't it omnidirectional it hurry okay move it up okay sure hare krishna is it better now yeah okay thank you so when the <clears throat> train of thought starts off it starts off like a train is stationary it starts off when the engine starts moving so like the first the thought occurs in our mind that's a pattern we could say that's a words in our inner screen so sometimes there can be thoughts which are words in our inner screen sometimes the starting may also be a image something appears oh that happened at that time say so something happens now uh, the mind is to think that some small things can trigger big reactions in us why because that small thing is not seen in isolation the mind connects it with something say i lose something and if i now we all may sometimes lose some things but oh, you know you always keep losing things you are always irresponsible you're always foolish you're good for nothing you lost that you lost that you lost that you lost that so that's how the thoughts start moving forwards in this way when the thoughts thoughts start moving they start off with one image oh i lost this it can be a thought in the sense of words or it can be an image that image we also still we it's our thinking and then as we start moving forwards we start getting more and more carried away by it so when the thought occur occurs at that time if we could evaluate it it's just like if a train is starting to move at that time only the driver checks hey is the train moving in the right direction or the wrong direction so then we can check it oh it shouldn't move in this direction now all of us have certain attachments on or we could say we all have certain mental tendencies mental tendencies means that uh, our thoughts tend to go in particular directions so for some of us the thoughts may go in the direction of say like earlier i said self pity always things keep going wrong with me sometimes the thoughts may go in terms of some attachment it may be say for somebody is alcoholic then as soon as they want pleasure immediately the thoughts will go to alcohol as soon as they want some uh, relief immediately the thoughts will go to alcohol so when we have certain tendencies that means if you consider this train if the train is on a ground that is inclined then even a little push will cause the train to start moving 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 just like i think a couple of days ago there was some news in india that a train moved several kilometers without any engine <laughs> how because if the engine had been removed but the train got its own momentum the driver was not there the train kept moving 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 so now the train is not meant to move without an engine but if there's an inclination then the train will just move on like that so similarly for us we all have certain thought patterns which we have become habituated to and going along that thought pattern becomes natural a it does not require effort to go along that thought pattern rather it requires effort to not go along that thought pattern just like if a floor is inclined if i have some toy and the toy is kept on the floor normally it will be stationary but if that 
floor is inclined, then the toy will automatically start moving in that direction. So the way we have thought, the way we have acted in the past, it all creates impressions within us. And those impressions, especially when they become very strong, they, they create inclinations within our consciousness. Inclination means that's how our consciousness will move. So if I'm habituated to negative thinking, always, you know, it is said that, that um, you know, for every problem, there is a solution. That is how optimists think. And with every solution, there is a problem. That's how pessimists think. Now it's true that every problem, we can find a solution to it. And whatever solution we find in this world, there will be problems with that also. That's just the way the world is. It's always dualities are there. But what we focus on. Now some, you tell somebody that, why do you think so negative? Yeah, I'll think positive. I, I'll think positive. And then, I'm going to think positive. I'm going to think positive. And then as they're thinking, I'm going to think positive. But you know, one day I'll think positive, but tomorrow again I'll start thinking negative. <laughs> now when they're thinking like that, it is not that tomorrow they will think negative. Today only they started thinking negative. <laughs> so what has happened? That where we are inclined in a particular way, our thoughts will naturally go in that direction. And uh, when the thoughts start going in a particular direction, it requires effort to stop them. So, so now the Bhagavad Gita talks about a very a interesting concept in the second chapter. The same 62-63 is this chain from contemplation to self-destruction. Now the opposite of it, Krishna talks about it little later. In 2.70, he used a metaphor to talk about how this can be avoided. So he says that <clears throat> just as rivers flow into an ocean, but the ocean doesn't get disrupted by it. Similarly, he says many inputs will flow into our consciousness. Desires will flow into our consciousness, but they don't have to agitate us. Krishna is a very interesting compound word over here. Na kama kami. So kama is desire. Kami is desirer. So Krishna says, who can be satisfied? Sashanti maapnoti. Who will have peace? One who is not the desirer of desire. So what does desirer of desire mean? That means that by certain past impressions, some desires will pop up within us. So if somebody is say habituated to drinking alcohol, then the desire for alcohol will naturally pop up within them. And then when the desire pops up, oh, what do I do with it? Do I start contemplating it? Do I start craving for it? If I do that, then I get carried away by it. But if I don't do that, if I don't, be, okay, this is popped up over here, let it be there for some time, I will not pay attention to it. So to understand how we can do this, to understand basically how the mind works, let's do a simple thought experiment. So wherever you're sitting, you can sit comfortably and you can close your eyes. Don't go to sleep. Just close your eyes. And along with me, you can take three deep breaths. One. Let all the air go out. Two. Three. Now, with your eyes closed, look at what you see in front of you. Because your eyes are closed, you will not see physically whatever is in front. But there is something like an inner screen inside you where you may see various things. You may see some image of this room. You may see your own house. You may see your family members. You may see your home. You may see your car, or you might just see some colorless, dull kind of pattern. 
and the images on this inner screen may also keep changing. Now, as you are observing this inner screen, try to take a step back and look at who is observing this inner screen. Take a step back and try to see who is observing the inner screen. Try once again. You are seeing the inner screen, but move back. Try to see who is looking at that inner screen. No matter how many steps you take back, the inner seer takes steps back with you. What you are looking for is what you are looking with. So that inner seer is the soul. And the inner screen is the mind. The inner seer is the soul, the inner screen is the mind. You can take one deep breath and then you can open your eyes. Thank you. Yeah, you can open your eyes. So, this kind of contemplation can help us understand that we are different from our mind. There's an inner screen on which many things appear and some, usually we just get so caught by whatever appears on the inner screen that we identify with it and start acting accordingly. But if we can distance ourselves, yeah, I am not that inner screen. I am the inner seer. Just as say in your house, there might be a cartoon show going on and say so the children are just watching that cartoon show, completely glued to it. Now, you are also in their same house. The, the TV is also there for you to see. But you can look at the TV screen and you can look at the person who is looking at the TV screen. They are so caught over there. They are so excited. They're sometimes they are excited, sometimes they are agitated. Sometimes they go through different emotions. So, but when you get caught in watching the TV, then what happens? Our consciousness gets invested there and that's what we experience. So for us as souls, the mind is where the outer world appears. And not just perception from the outer world appear, also recollections from the inner world also appear. Whatever we have thought in the past, that also appears on the inner world. And if we get caught in watching the TV, if you consider the mind to be like a TV screen, then we get caught in watching the TV, then our emotions start go getting shaped by whatever we are seeing on the TV. But if we don't focus on watching the TV, you can be in the same room where somebody is watching the TV and they are excited by it. You know, sometimes if you, if you go to a movie theater, there are these uh, ticket checkers in the movie theater. I don't know if they are there now. Uh, probably I had not gone to a theater for 25, 30 years now. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so I don't know. Oh, but there, there's ticket checkers. Now they have seen the movie so many times. So people who are watching the movie get excited. I mean, now what will happen? Now what will happen? Now what will happen? But they, they are looking at the movie theater. They are looking at all the spectators. Because for them it's an old story. They don't get excited by that. So similarly for us, either we can be the spectator who watches the movie or we can be the observer who watches the spectacle. The spectacle is that this person is sitting safely. If it's a horror movie going on, people may be sitting comfortably on their seats in the AC theater, but they're sweating, they're trembling. Some of them may be screaming. What is happening? That's because the consciousness is invested over there. So similarly, for us, when our consciousness gets invested, then our emotions get shaped accordingly. But if we can take a step back, okay, that, okay, this, this image is going on over here. This image has popped up on my inner screen. Do I need to focus on it? That, say somebody is watching the TV and say the kids are watching the TV there, and if you stop the TV, they're going to protest. They want to watch it right now. Now we may not be able to stop the TV, but we can choose whether we want to focus on the TV screen. 
can focus elsewhere and our emotions won't get invested that much. So similarly for us, we frequently what appears on our inner screen is not in our control. Sometimes people act in unreasonable ways. Sometimes life just gives us a raw deal. So what happens, some bad things happen in the outer world and they get reflected on our inner screen. Or sometimes just some bad images come from the past and they get reflected on the inner screen. They get depicted on the inner screen. Now, as I said, we can't always control what appears on the inner screen. But we can control whether we get carried away by it or not. Whether we focus on it or not. So how do we do this? For this, we need to, first of all, philosophically understand that I am different from my mind. At the mind, thoughts are coming within it, but that is just a screen on which thoughts are coming. The Bhagavad Gita in the uh, 15th chapter, Krishna talks about how the mind works. And there he says, actually, uh, 15.7, 15 he says how the soul is suffering in the material world. Says the soul is a part of Krishna. Krishna is right next to the soul. But it's like the child is sitting next to the mother. But the child is watching the horror movie. The child is trembling, scared. So like that, the soul is a part of Krishna. The soul is next to Krishna. But the soul is caught in whatever is being depicted by the mind and the senses. And manha shashthani indriyani. Because of this what happens? Prakriti sthani. In the material world, karshati. One is agitated. One is agitated. Very agitated. In the, uh, in the 13th chapter, two chapters earlier, Krishna talks about how this world is like the kshetra. And the soul is the kshetra gyo. Kshetra is the field. And kshetra gyo is the knower of the field. And when he's talking about the Kshetra Gya, there he says that Bhumira, no, not Bhumira. Mahabhutanya hankaro buddhir avyaktam evacha indriyani dashaikam cha pancha chendriya gocharaha ichad besha sukham dukham sanghatas chetanadrithi etad kshetram samasena savikara mudharatam. This is 13.6 and 7 in the Gita. There he's saying that. He describes the material world is made up of 24 elements. There are the 11 senses, there are the 10 senses, knowledge acquiring and uh, <coughs> action senses, working senses. Like that, he gives a list of 24 elements. But a significant thing, I won't go into that technical list. But for us, this important thing is, important thing is Krishna says, Icha dvesha sukham dukham sanghatas chetanadhriti. This is our attachment and our aversions, our happiness and our distress our convictions and even our consciousness itself. All these are Kshetra Vikar. Kshetra Vikar means they are transformations of material nature. Now in the first chapter, Krishna has already said that consciousness comes from the soul. Consciousness does not come from matter. And yet here in the 13th chapter, Krishna is saying consciousness is a transformation of material nature. Kshetra Vikar. What does it mean? Actually, consciousness comes from the soul. But right now, for all practical purposes, the soul's consciousness is invested in the body, in the physical structure of the body and the mind. And the soul at present cannot experience consciousness separate from the body and the mind. It's like a person, that's like when we go to watch it. Now we can watch movies at our home. And we can watch movies in a theater. And the same movie may be available at home also. Still people go to the theater and pay a lot of money. Why? Because they can immerse themselves in that experience. They can avoid all distraction. They can experience the reality. So when a movie starts, what happens? Two things happen. First is, one light goes off. All lights around go off. And then one light goes on. There is a light on the monitor. And in that way, we don't see anything else. We just get riveted to what is happening on the screen. 
Uh, similarly, when the soul comes to the material world, or the soul is in the material world, at that time, there are two energies. There is the Avaranatmika Shakti, and there is the Prakshepatmika Shakti. The Avaranatmika Shakti is like the lights go off. The soul forgets, soul becomes blinded to everything at the spiritual level. Although we are like the spectator, so the soul is here and the body mind machine is here. The soul is uh, soul is the spectator in the theater, and the theater's monitor theater screen is like the mind. But presently, because of the Avaranatmika Shakti, the soul can't perceive anything else, just like if it's pitch dark in the theater. Then you can't see anything. You can only see what is ahead. So similarly for us, by the Avarnatmika Shakti, at present, we can't perceive consciousness. As, we can't use our consciousness to perceive anything apart from the body-mind. The consciousness, we could say, locked to the body and mind. And this Avarnatmika Shakti is what causes darkness of spiritual reality. And the Prakshipatmika Shakti it is a throwing potency. Our Natmika is covering. So all spiritual reality gets covered. And Prakshepatmika is the pushing or throwing energy. What it does is, it pushes our consciousness towards material nature, towards the screen of the mind. And thus we get glued to it. We get fixated with it. And then when this happens, so 15 points says, Karshati. Krishna says the soul suffers in material existence. How does the soul suffer? He says in the next verse, Shariram yadavapnoti yachapyutkramati ishwaraha gruhitvaitani sanyati vayurgandhani vashayat. He says the soul acquires one body, gives up one body and goes to another body. This is the prakshipatmik shakti, throwing energy is so great that the mind and senses pull the soul from one sense object to another, one image to another, one pleasure to another, lifetime after lifetime. Now, when the soul comes to a new body, there the soul gets a new apparatus. It's like we watch one horror movie in one movie, in one movie theater. And as soon as the show gets over, it's like we are picked up and thrown into another theater where another horror movie starts. <laughs> and there we get glued to it. Now, even horror movies, it's not constantly horror. There's some horror, there's some action, there's some hope, again there's horror. There's some hope, again there's horror. So like that, we just get caught and thrown from one horror movie to another horror movie. And in the, when we get a new body, what happens? Shotram chakshus parshanam cha rasanam ghranam eva cha adhishthayam anashayam vishayan upasevate And the soul gets these five knowledge acquiring senses. Shrotra is the ears, yeah. Chakshuhu, eye, Shrotra cha. Shotram Chakshu, Sparshanam cha. Sparshanam means? Tacha. Rasanam? Taste. Tongue. Granam? Smell. Yeah. Thank you. So these five senses are there. Adhishthaya Manashchayam. All these are centered around the mind. And then through these, Vishayan Upasevate, the soul tries to enjoy the sense objects. So basically, if you want to understand this mechanism, I'll, uh, I'll still give the example of a screen on which a, uh, which a person is observing. So the mind is like that inner screen. But let's uh, make this picture a little more, uh, let's develop this metaphor a little bit more now. If we consider that instead of just a movie theater, there's a monitor over there, but let's uh, shift to consider another mo monitor of another kind. If there is a monitor which is a multi, which is in a security room in a very high security building. So it's a big monitor and there are say five doors in that building. And at each door there is a CCTV camera. And the inputs from that CCTV camera are brought to this monitor. And there's a security in charge who's sitting over there. And whatever is happening. In all the uh, doors, he, he can see. see. And then if any suspicious looking character seems to be coming from any door, immediately press. And that window zooms out. Mm -hmm. That window zooms out and they can see what is going on over here. 
So, similarly, for all of us, we could say our mind is like a monitor, but it's not just one image over there. So, right now, say you are hearing what I'm speaking, but at the same time, you know, you are also sensing. Okay, you're sitting on a floor or a sofa. Is it soft? Is it comfortable? Is it not comfortable? So, there are many sensations that are coming in. So, say right now, when you are sitting and you are hearing the class, so ideally speaking. It is the if we out of the five windows that are there, the eye, the eyes window, and the sound window, they are prominent. Mm -hmm. And suppose uh, as you are hearing this, suddenly there is a delicious fragrance of a halwa that comes out. <laughs> then as soon as the fragrance of halwa comes in, then what happens? Immediately the nose window. Zooms out, <laughs> and our consciousness. Hey, okay, halwa. When will I get it? Uh, will there be enough for second helpings? <laughs> so our consciousness gets carried away. So, so this window zooming up and zooming down, it is constantly happening within us. And when I talk about this window, which some window zooms up, some window zooms down. This most of the time happens so fast that we don't even notice it. You now, if you are driving a car, at that time, say we are focusing on the driving. At the same time, if the person sitting next to us is talking with us, and then we are also hearing what they are saying. So we hear it, we give it some due attention. We may talk talk also, but we also have a part of our awareness which is focused on the car. And if suddenly something unexpected happens, or the traffic is becoming a little crowded, or we are not sure. Oh, which is the road I am to take? Then what we will do at that time? We will just minimize the sound window. We'll talk later, or if they are talking, we'll not hear. We'll focus on the eye window, and this way we are able to process how to do things in the world, what is happening, and how to respond. We process. So the mind is the inner screen that is the integrator and the presenter. Of inputs coming from the outer world, so the, from the five senses, the inputs come in. They are integrated on the screen of the mind, and they are presented for the soul to respond to. Of course, the picture is even more complicated. There are not just five windows over there. You could say each window can have multiple sub windows also. So, for example, right now you are hearing what I am speaking. But say if there are some children who are gossiping behind, you, or chit chatting, <laughs> no problem. You can continue. <laughs> if you are chit chatting over there, then you may want to. Then you may be thinking if 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 we find something that the chit chatting interesting, then what happens? Instead of the, this sound window, that sound window zooms out, <laughs> and then we start hearing that. We start hearing that. Oh, what is going on over here? So so each of these windows can have multiple sub windows. And beyond that, the, apart from these five sensory windows, there is also one you could say window which can have infinite windows, and that is the recollection window. Browsing history. <laughs> browsing history. Yeah. <laughs> I'll come to browsing history a little later. Good point. So, what happens with browse? This recollection window at any time, any thought can pop up in the mind. Sometimes I may just be sitting and chanting nicely. And some other devotee comes in. He says, "You know, six years ago, I had given this devotee one dollar, <laughs> but that devotee didn't pay me back. <laughs> Now, where did that thought come from? It just comes up. Suddenly, it just pops up. So sometimes the recollection happens. Recollection is stimulated by some observation from outside. We see someone, and something thought comes up." And sometimes the recollection may come without any apparent external stimulus. Also, Prabhupada gives the example that if there is a if there is a still lake, sometimes the ripples in that lake may form because somebody throws a stone from outside, or sometimes there may be fermentation from inside because of which the ripples may also come. So, so this recollection window is it's, it's a window. We could say it's like an ocean of windows over there. So now, in all this, 
we all perceive certain things at certain times and usually when we function normally then we focus on that window which requires attention but sometimes the wrong window zooms out so if i am driving and while driving uh, suddenly the person sitting next to me speaks something shocking so when they speak something shocking at that time we may get so shocked that the sound window just zooms out and then we may just get so shocked that we don't notice where we are going and we just go and almost nearly hit the next car and then bang we press the brake so sometimes the wrong window may zoom out in now to further complicate this example you know on each of these windows it's not just a image that comes it's a it's good it's a it's a movie that comes over there <laughs> <laughs> and that movie may not be based on what is actually happening out there it some one event happens out there but that triggers a movie so that brings to browsing history mm -hmm. so what happens for us is that uh, the mind basically is a is a it's a device which acts based on its past impressions so suppose say somebody has visited some website say they have visited some website called say bollywood.com hmm so they visited again and again and now they just came to a spiritual program they heard about the bhagavad gita now they want to google bhagavad gita they type b and what happens <laughs> immediately bollywood pops up so why does that happen because that has what been selected in the past again and again so what we have selected in the past will pop up again and again and again so in the and i said there is a recollection window there is a perception window now these windows for analysis sake i said they are separated but actually a perception window trigger when a, when one window when something appears on the one window that trigger some recollection and what will be triggered will be based on what we have thought earlier so if if i think that some person is you know very arrogant then as soon as i see that person they may be walking normally <laughs> just see how proudly he is walking <laughs> now somebody else may also walk that way he's a nice person <laughs> usually the stimulus may be the same but how we interpret the stimulus that is determined by what kind of impressions are stored in the past and this is how the train of thoughts starts off so there is something which comes up in the perception and then there is a recollection and this perception recollection they merge together and some movie is formed and that movie starts playing and the more that movie starts playing the more we get caught in it the more we get caught in that movie and it just goes on and on and on so here when we understand that a, if there is a monitor on which a particular window has zoomed up now the security in charge has to be very careful uh, to recognize where i should focus on so okay if this window has zoomed out but okay what is happening over here is not that important sometimes when some thieves want to come in they may use decoys they may just create a disruption at one door and all the security goes to that door and then they sneak in from the other door hmm? so now the security in charge has to be which okay we have, we have to pay attention there but it will also keep an eye on the other things so when things pop out and they our they zoom out on our inner screen if we can we don't just identify it but we evaluate it okay this is zoom up does this need to, do i need to pay attention to this and do i need to pay attention to this right now that if we learn to evaluate then we will be able to uh, keep ourselves we will be able to break the train of the thoughts of the mind when it is necessary so when krishna says no kama kami do not be a desirer of desire what he means by that is that first desire is like a like a image or a th uh, some words that pop up on our inner screen when they pop up over there we can't stop that that's like river coming into an ocean but we don't become the desirer of desire that means when it pops up 
we don't get glued to it rather we evaluate it we we don't desire it okay let it come let it stay there so that window has zoomed out but then sometimes say we are working on our computer and suddenly some notice comes a new software update is available do you want to update now i may decide okay i can update this later so i say later remind me later remind me after a day or uh, remind me after an hour so we we that we can't stop that notification from coming on the screen but we can choose whether to act on it or not so similarly on our inner screen we can't always control what appears but we can control whether we pay attention to it and what kind of attention we pay to it how we respond to it and this capacity as we develop then we will be able to focus on the thoughts which work for our good and avoid the thoughts that work against us so some train of thoughts take us to a good destination some train of thoughts take us to a bad destination by learning to become observant of our inner world we can train ourselves to distance our, uh, to evaluate the thoughts and interrupt the train when it is necessary so how to interrupt this i'll talk in tomorrow's class uh, i'll talk tomorrow about the bhagavad gita 14th chapter which talks about two broad attitudes one is sakshi bhav and the other is seva bhav become a an observer and become a servitor so related with that different strategies of how to interrupt the train of thoughts we'll discuss in tomorrow's session i'll summarize what i spoke today i spoke today on the topic of training ourselves to interrupt the mind's train of thoughts and in that i talked about uh, <clears throat> i started by how <clears throat> we i my own experience i talked about how i organized a program but i organized a essay writing competition but instead of being happy at the end i started feeling sorry for myself while watching a eclipse instead of observing the telescope i got caught by my thoughts so what happens in the inner world is often quite consequential sometimes more consequential than what happens in the outer world also so what exactly happens in the inner world we talked about uh, the train of thoughts which can make us miserable which can make us uh, uh, which angry which can make us uh, crave for things that to, at, in that thoughts can have two meanings it's like a suitcase uh, has a handle so the same handle can be there for different suitcases so the handle is like the term and the suitcase is like the concept so the word thought is like the term and it can be uh, referred to two distinct concepts so i got a thought that means it just refers to a initial event that occurs on our inner screen i have given this a lot of thought that means i have put in conscious i have consciously evaluated analyze what to do so we primarily talking about stopping the train of thoughts means we are referring to the first meaning of the word thought so when this occurs at that time if we don't evaluate then from contemplation to self destruction is where this train can take us and the more the train travels the more we get carried away by train of thoughts the more difficult it is to stop it and to stop it uh, what do we need to do we need to understand that this thought is different from me so on our inner screen when words appear you are good for nothing the uh, thoughts are basically words appearing on either screen uh, and we could say memories or images they are basically something uh, something verbal appearing is thought something visual appearing is images and we did the thought thought experiment about how we can even with closed eyes we can see something on our inner screen but we can't see the sear of that inner screen so the inner screen is the mind the outer the inner sear is the soul and normally when uh, if uh, so if somebody is watching a tv and a horror movie they are watching somebody else sees this somebody can watch else can also watch the movie or they can watch the spectacle how this person is getting carried away so we need to shift our position the on the mind some images will keep coming we need to shift our position from being the spectator from being the spectator to the observer of the spectacle uh, and for this i analyzed how do we get get caught as the spectator by the avarnatmika and the prakshipatmika shifti when you in the movie theater first the light surrounding to us go off and the light on the monitor goes on so like that the avarnatmika shifti we are souls who are different from the body mind 
but presently the soul's capacity for spiritual awareness is deadened so consciousness comes from the soul but currently consciousness is locked in the body that's why krishna refers to chetana as a kshetra vikar as a transformation of consciousness that is all the consciousness that we can experience presently so because of the avaranatmika shakti we get blinded to spiritual reality and because of the prakshapatmika shakti we get caught in material reality so we can't directly pursue spiritual reality but we can understand that i am the observer of material reality i i don't have to be caught in that material reality and for that purpose i, I develop the metaphor further is there is that the mind is like a screen which is the integrator and presenter of the inputs from the five senses like a monitor in a high security building which has inputs from five cctv cameras coming from the five doors and normal functioning requires that the window which requires attention is what zooms up and also along with these five windows there is also one window which can have unlimited window that is a recollection window so normally when we function the right window does zoom up but sometimes by our conditioning some other window may zoom up just like if the floor is inclined in a particular way thoughts will go in that direction so some similarly for us based on our past conditions past impressions some windows tend to zoom out some thought train of thoughts just comes off starts off and just goes off completely just like if i have selected a particular website repeatedly then even if i want to go to some other website that previous website uh, is what comes up so when we become when all these windows are opening even if a wrong window opens up instead of just watching the movie what is there we step back and okay this is what is going on do i need to pay attention to this right now if you can observe that then we can interrupt the train of thoughts and thus we can ensure that our thoughts don't take us to an unwanted destination but rather they take us towards a desirable destination thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna so. So, are there any questions or comments? I have a question. Yes, please. So uh, you said that uh, our past impressions, yeah, uh, will ref will reflect on our thoughts. Yeah. So everybody is not fortunate. So maybe some people have got deaths in their family. Some may have divorced. Some may have lost their land. Some may have been cheated. So there are so many uh, thoughts which are there in our mind twenty four seven because you know there is something that has happened in their life which is very very drastic. so how does one control that and how does one uh, combat this window which is always there in the back of our mind the subconscious mind also and even though when we are driving or driving it comes up so how do we combat that yeah. you know there are sometimes some tv serials which end with a cliffhanger but the hero has been thrown from a cliff and the hero is holding on to the cliff and and the villain is trying to stamp on that hero's hands and to be continued next week <laughs> so <laughs> it comes like that so uh, i think the class ended like that all the questions are going to be answered in tomorrow's class <laughs> okay but i'll answer briefly <laughs> i'll give a pre preview of this see basically uh we can't avoid what will come up hmm what will come up in our inner screen but at that moment we may get carried away but later on we can evaluate okay when i was driving this is what happened or when i was bathing this is what happened we can observe what are the times when our we get carried away by unwanted thoughts and at that time and then when we have observed that we can plan how to create some alternative direction for our thoughts so if i'm going along a road and i i know there is a pothole ahead then i'll prepare either i'll slow down or i'll swerve and go by the other side so like that at the moment when the thoughts carry us away it's very difficult but later on we can evaluate and then we can plan to have something else for our mind to feed to contemplate so if we like to hear kirtans i have some nice kirtans going on constantly if you like to hear some philosophy 
have some philosophy going on constantly. If you like to memorize verses, then just memorize the verse and keep it as a critical technique. Right? So basically, we need to consciously provide the mind, provide ourselves alternative channels for our consciousness. And initially, some pushing is required to push it along that direction. But if we don't do that, by default, those thoughts will come. Uh, but if we provide ourselves alternative channels, then it is relatively easier. It's not easy, it is relatively easier. It is going to require effort. But at least it's possible. It's like if the floor is inclined in this way, the water is going to flow in this direction. But what I try to do is, that okay, the water is going to flow in this direction. But in that I try to create a channel, let the water flow in this direction. Okay, it is, I don't, it won't go flow here, it will flow related but somewhere else. So we try to create a wedge in the floor by which it can go in that direction. So like that we have to find out some constructive activities which we feel attracted to and which can be done in the background as a default. So when we do that, that helps us to check the mind, from check from getting carried away by those thoughts. So each of us will have to do some inventory to find out what thoughts, uh, what, what activities can become the constructive background uh, activity that can be going on for us to prevent the mind's unwanted replace. Okay. Right. Very good. Any other questions or comments? Yes, please. I'm kind of evaluating your class here. You could be giving a Bhagavad Gita class on 626. Yeah, beautiful. Yes, correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So 620. This is a the Bhagavad class on 626. 626 is Yato Yato Nishchalati Manas Chanchala Mastiram Tatas Yaitad That wherever and whenever the mind wanders, bring it back on the self. Like yesterday I was in Baltimore. I spoke of Sunday feast on the same verse actually. Mm -hmm. So the topic there was the mind may stray away. Don't let it stay away. <laughs> so yeah. So it's very good observation. Thank you, Prabhuji. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Thank you for being uh, another wonderful class, Prabhupada. You've asked a number of questions. Great. Hmm. 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 Mind will carry uh, to multiple lifetimes. Uh, is it like only uh, the, I don't know the extent of the thoughts is only for one uh, past impressions? That's what you said. So, is, is it possible that when the soul takes. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, do the thoughts and the impressions do they stay for one lifetime or do they carry over from one lifetime to other lifetimes? It, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, of course. It is the impressions are stored in the mind. And when the soul goes from one body to another, it actually carries the mind with it. So the the hardware, we could say that so the body is like the hardware, it's left behind. But the mind goes with the soul to the next body. And that's why uh, there are impressions which are we all carry. And that's why even if uh, say parents have two children, the two children are not similar. Even if they're twins, they may be similar in looks. But they are not similar in personality. Their upbringing may be exactly the same. Because they are in the same house, same parents. But what is it that is different? That is, the impressions which they are carrying in their life, from in this life, from the previous life, they have come from there. So those impressions will create some default momentum, some default inclination in our consciousness. But they don't force us. You know, our past, our past explains our inclinations but it doesn't excuse our actions that means see there is a distance between what uh, what thoughts come in our mind and what actions we do at one level this is uh, not so difficult to understand now we all have various relationships with each other and we can't see what goes on in each other's minds. And that is a great blessing. 
if we all could see what was going on in each other's minds not a single relationship would be sustained you think like this about me you had that thought you had that thought you know, it would be just impossible to sustain any relationship but nature has given us the buffer between the mind and the body between a thought appearing in the mind and an action happening at the physical level we all have certain level of will power certain level of self restraint now we may or may not exercise it that varies but we all have it and we do exercise it to some extent we don't always even if we are angry with our boss we won't will not shout at our boss yeah we say some devotees may say i don't have any self control you know i have very weak will power but you know, when you are working at the job we do have we do we control our emotions we, even if i don't feel like doing my job i do my job even if i feel like shouting at my boss i'll be very polite and deferential <laughs> so what am i doing i'm just basically using my will power to ensure that my emotions don't come out at the physical level so we do all have will power we do all have control so here is a good example of a emotion popping up on the inner screen but we choosing not to act on it so this is of course largely because of we feel that this is important for me and i can't afford to express the emotions over it so the past determines past can explain our inclinations but it doesn't excuse our actions so basically our actions are shaped by five different factors first is our past which could be we could call past karma which comes as the samskaras from birth second is our upbringing uh the way our parents helped us to grow up what kind of thoughts they what kind of thoughts ideas habits they gave us third is our association somebody may have grown up in a very pious family but if they go to college and they get exposed to a whole world of sin they start getting uh they start hanging with say people who kids who drink and smoke and take drugs then what happens that association spoils them then so there is past life impressions that some scars we could say then there is as upbringing there is association beyond that is our free will so all these push us but we can push back if we don't push back we will be pushed in that direction but we have the capacity to counter push that's our free will and the fifth is krishna's mercy so now krishna's mercy can act in two ways one is that it increases our capacity to push back and th- second is that it decreases the force of all these sometimes some temptations come and we we hear a nice class we chanted very nicely i'm not going to do this if it very strong so that is conviction conviction means our own intelligence and our own determination to resist that pushing has become very strong but sometimes if we keep practicing bhakti after some time there is purification purification means we don't feel the desire only some of us might have been eating meat before if we start practicing bhakti and then if we are traveling in a plane and say the neighbor next to us starts eating meat we don't even feel the desire to eat meat so although earlier we might have been attached to it also so what has happened the push is no longer there so that is krishna's mercy so this these four factors are always there and krishna's mercy is like the fifth factor it's like the you know in software you have the wild card wild card only that's what you use so it's it can drastically change things so it can increase our free will's potency it can also decrease the pushing influence of the other factors okay thank you hare krishna so yes mataji In fourteen chapter, Prabhu uh, says that if all the gates are immovable by knowledge, one is settled in the mode of Krishna. Can you explain that? What is what does it mean by the gates of the body? Okay, yeah, thank you. Good question. So in fourteen point eleven, it is said that when all the gates of the body are illumined by knowledge, that is indicates the mode of goodness. Sarvadvare shudehe smin prakash upajayate. ज्ञानम यदा तदा विद्या विवृद्धम सत्वम इत्युत सो नाउ द द्वार द डोर्स टू द बॉडी आर द सेंसेस द आईज द इयर्स द नोज नाउ डज इट देयर आर मेनी टाइम्स व्हेन द भगवत गीता कैन नॉट बी टेकन लिटरली 
Hmm? If you take the, Bhagav uh, the, the Bhagavad Gita is at one level, a historical record, it's based on itihas. So in that sense, it has its central narrative is literal. But within that, it's a work of poetry. And work of poetry means that there will be there will be situations where non-literal usages are there. So like what is night for all living beings is a day for the self-realized. Now what does it mean? Is it that the sun rises differently for different people? No. So it is a non-literal meaning. So similarly here, the Dwara Prakash, illumination of the doors of the senses. It doesn't mean that when somebody comes to goodness, they open their eyes, light comes out of their eyes. They, light comes out of their ears or light comes out of their nose. It's not that. Normally, illumination means, let's say if there's a door over there and the door is dark, then some thief may sneak in, we will not notice only. Or some child may slip out, we will not notice only. But if the door is lit, then we can observe who is coming and who is going out. And we can decide whether to let that person in or to let this person out. Similarly, when the doors of the senses are illumined, that means we have the discrimination, we have the discerning capacity, we have the intelligence by which we can evaluate what to take in and what to let out. So sometimes the nature of this world is that now we will see so many tempting objects in the world. So they will appear on the screen or on the door of our senses. So, so if I if I've got diabetes, and it's not that because I have got diabetes, the world will stop making sweet items. Is it? it? <laughs> sweet items are still going to come. But then I can decide that okay, I'm not going to I'm not going to think about it. If I think about it, I'll crave for it more and more and more. So okay, this I don't have to take it in. Let me look at some other food. Let me eat something else. So that discrimination when it is there, you can decide what to let inside and what to not let inside. Similarly, we can decide what to let out and what to not let out. So some people speak to express their thoughts and some people speak to discover their thoughts. <laughs> they speak and they speak, ah, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> so we all have slips of tongue. So basically, that means something slipped out of the door of the mouth without our wanting to speak that. So what comes in, what goes out, we are able to evaluate it. There is the, the discretion, the knowledge by which you can evaluate. So Generally, we can say that three modes, if you want to understand, I'll talk about this more tomorrow, that in goodness, there is first contemplation, then action. In passion, there is first action, then contemplation. I do it and then think, hey, maybe I should not have done this. And in ignorance, there is neither contemplation nor action. There is simply delusion. So when it gets caught in the lost in the mental world, not doing anything practical. So Krishna is saying that when the illumination is there, the doors of the senses are illumined. That means we can appropriately process what to let in and what to let out. Okay? Thank you. So shall we stop here? Yes. So we'll continue tomorrow. Thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Jai Gaur Premanandi. Before we get up, I wanted to announce one thing. Today we have two new devotees uh, coming to the class. Let's welcome them. Yes, yes. So Kaliya Krishna Mataji has come all the way from Prabhupada village, Sandirish. So please welcome her by saying three times Haribol.